welcome. It's Friday. You made it through another week, and we appreciate you being here with us. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. Hey, quick mention. Remember, tomorrow night, I'll be hosting Coast to Coast AM, so you can get six days of Supernatural Talk this week. So make sure you tune in tomorrow on Coast to Coast AM. You can go to coasttocoastam.com. Check out uh, the website there. You'll find out about when the show is on in your city, state, and area. Again, if you go to coast to coast am.com forward slash stations, you'll find all the stations in and around the United States and around the world, all the ways you can listen to the best in overnight talk radio when I sit in for George Norrie tomorrow night on Coast to Coast AM. Tonight, we've got a great show lined up for you. Tim is still off. He will be back with us next week when we have a brand new Supernatural News and Parish here Monday lined up for you as well. Uh, Tonight, though, we've got uh, got a really cool topic, and this is something I've been excited about uh, getting involved in. We've been talking about it all week. The extra dimensionals, true tales and concepts of alien visitors. Our guest this evening, John D'Souza, is a former FBI special agent investigator for over 20 years and collector of real life X Files. He's also the best selling author of The Extra Dimensionals and a leading investigator in the paranormal and exopolitics. Welcome to the show, John D'Souza. Thank you for being here this evening, sir. All right, David. It's wonderful to be here with you on Darkness Radio. I was uh, uh, miss uh, I miss Tim here, but uh, we'll we'll get along, I guess, without him. Yeah, and- we'll, we'll limp it along this time, I guess. <laughs> we'll we can have you back. You certainly have enough to chat about. It seems absolutely, so, I, I do. John, uh, you you were with the FBI. Are they okay with you coming forward and talking about this, or is it because well you're no longer with the FBI? They don't really care what you do or say. <laughs> Well, you know, it's kind of in between the two, uh, like you and I have uh, spoken about in the past. Uh, when I first uh, when I first left the FBI, when I first retired and I was writing books, uh, even at that time, uh, it was funny. It was a strange thing. I, I spoke I spoke to the organization and at first I thought that uh, I thought that they would have some problem with me, my books that I was writing. Uh, But then when I made it clear to them that my books were on the paranormal, it's a strange thing. You know, government people don't. And I and I told them and they said, well, then your books are fiction. And I said, no, it's my books are all nonfiction about real events that happen to real people and uh, including people in law enforcement. And uh, they said, so, but you're saying it's nonfiction. And I said, yes, absolutely. It's real things that happen, true stories, true tales and events that happen to real people. And they just didn't quite able to compute it. And they (laughs) just kind of the conclusion was just kind of like, well, yeah, right. uh, Do whatever you want then. That's fine. As long as it's all labeled paranormal, uh, it doesn't really the uh, the gist of it was it doesn't really seem real to them. And that's kind of how government people are in general. Uh, Anything that's on the paranormal, they just won't recognize it as real. So therefore, uh, basically, they were like, oh, you can do whatever you want. Basically, if it all says paranormal, then we're fine with it. You know, I. (laughs) <laughs> now, now, as a special investigator, were there cases like the X Files, or is that all just uh, entertainment fodder? You know, absolutely, uh, there were cases, and I'll tell you how I got the clue that uh, some X File cases were absolutely true. Uh, in the '90s, as a matter of fact, my uh, my nickname is the X Man, and it's not a compliment. It was a nickname that I got uh, in the FBI uh, in the '90s because I was uh, I was really a big, huge fan of this show called The X Files, which we, all of your audience, I'm sure, knows about and is familiar with. Uh, the X Files with Scalder and Molly uh, during the '90s, uh, in the '90s, and it was a show that was really fascinating, but it caused some problems, uh, not just for me, but for a few people people. Uh, the creator of the show, Chris Carter, he talks about this today. Uh, he was called up by some higher ups in the FBI when it became obvious that he was getting some information on procedures in the FBI because he was extremely accurate on some procedures, but also some of his stories 
appeared to be connected to things that really happened. Mm-hmm. And even and today, Chris Carter says uh, he got some got contacts from some higher ups in the FBI, and he believed uh, they were very aggressive contacts, uh, asking him uh, who was consulting with him, who was giving him information. And at the time, I was I was uh, on board as a special agent, and I was also questioned if I had had any contact with uh, the X Files uh, with Chris Carter. <laughs> Who was, and I was able to say, no, absolutely not. However, uh, I'm thinking that some retired FBI agents probably were uh, consulting with him, which is perfectly fine. That's actually uh, that's actually perfectly fine for if you're retired from the organization. And I'm sure that that's what was happening. But he was questioned on that. And uh, the fact that his show caused so much alarm that higher ups in the FBI and at the time uh, it got out that I was questioned on that. So then my nickname, the, the X Man, kind of stuck. Oh, After geez. that, I was told that I was demoted from G Man to X Man, nice. and that's uh, <laughs> and that's how that came about. So yeah, the I suspect because of all the alarm that was caused by the X Files, especially in the organization, I'm thinking that they several of their stories, and I'm still trying to drill down which ones were connected to absolute reality that really did happen in real life. Now, being an X. FBI agent, and if you don't mind, we explore this for a few minutes first. Oh, please. When you leave the service of the FBI, are you still sworn to secrecy regarding cases and 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 um, procedures and things like that? I know you said some retired uh, FBI agents are allowed to be consultants, but I mean, what, sure. to, to what level is your gag order in place? Well, the answer is yes and no, because uh, because many of our cases uh, concern uh, secret things that are that remain secret forever, basically. And, you know, methods and procedures that remain secret forever, but things that have been exposed to the public, like, for instance, many of our cases end up being completely criminal in nature. In other words, they're they go to trial. They're publicly exposed completely to to the press and to the people. And so you you can talk about them. Of course you can, because it's already in the public arena. So like, for instance, I worked I worked many of the very high, very high profile uh, terrorism, counterterrorism cases uh, throughout the throughout the years, especially uh, during the 90s and beyond. I worked uh, the Unabomber case, the single most successful terrorist in American history, really, if you look into it. Uh, the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, he was an individual that uh, was successful for almost, I think, almost 20 years in bombing people, blowing them up in their homes, in their businesses, uh, sending these individual packages to everyone, and he evaded capture for almost nearly 20 years. You know, Now, when people, you say that you were involved in that case, to what extent were you there when the door got kicked in? How did that all break down? Oh, geez. Well, because the Unabomber was on the loose and evaded detection for almost 20 years, I was probably one of hundreds uh, of FBI special agents. Uh, and now you add to that uh, regular law enforcement officers, probably brings it up to the thousands across the country of people who were searching for the Unabomber, trying to figure out the identity, creating profiles, uh, you know, it, conducting uh, investigations in their own states. But yeah, all 50 states and probably probably even outside the 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 CONUS were also uh, looking for the Unabomber, trying to come up with uh, an identity for him. So, well, What was his big slip-up? Was it just that he, didn't he have family members that said, you know, you might want to look into Ted. We think he might be your guy. Well, and you know, I write about this in my first book, The Para Investigators. I don't think he had a slip up. I think, and I, I write about this in my book, the power investigators, because there were so many of us involved in that investigation. There were so many of us searching for him that there were also groups of agents, people, law enforcement officers who would regularly meditate and try to try to use some supernatural methods and that's why my book is titled uh the power investigators um, uh, true tales and concepts of supernaturally gifted investigators because i i contend that our meditations on trying to find his identity i had we had members of our group 
that uh, one of them uh, came up with the information that the Unabomber was a woman, that he was a woman. And, and, and sure enough, later it was found he had some sort of sexual identity uh, confusions that uh, were very active in his in his life. Another one uh, came up with the, the thought that he was somewhere in a forest. He was somewhere in a forest and that we had to we had to uh, confine our searches to individuals individuals who were isolated in a forest you know and yet another one uh, others came up with other uh, aspects of his identity but overall what i believe happened was that somehow we connected with those meditations we connected to somebody who was able who actually was connected to him uh his brother the brother of the unabomber who ended up turning him in and we found out later that his brother was actually a very avid meditator who actually teaches meditation and i'm not sure which brand but he's actually he actually is well known and has his own has his own trademarks and so forth for teaching meditation to others and i just feel like somehow we connected to him and somehow convinced him to turn in his own brother which was a very tortured decision for him to make but luckily you know events the universe was able to you know to convince him that it was the right thing to do and thank god he did because that's the only thing that finally brought an end to the unabomber it's so, fascinating so you you had this group of investigators that would meditate and do this was this yeah. something that was uh, alphabet letter you know uh, company policy did they, did they try different methods like this or was no, this just something you guys were you no know, were no, doing no on the side Yes, on the side. This was definitely unauthorized on our part. And okay. when we would bring up this information to higher ups, it was not, um, it was not uh, favorably, uh, taken. And so, you know, we just had to, we just had to keep on uh, trudging, struggling forward with the physical, the purely physical aspect of the investigation and so just guys, going through you, you guys everything. In essence, trying to do remote viewing in a sense without the exact, remote viewing. Yes. Okay. At a time when, at a time when we didn't even know what the term remote viewing was, right. but yes, that's exactly what we were, what we were trying to do without being able to articulate it. We were trying to do because we were desperate. We were absolutely desperate, and so we had to employ other terms. And later on, when I found out that uh, the man who who made that incredibly difficult decision to turn in his brother, uh, when I later found out that he was a professional meditator and that he regularly reached out into the ether for ideas and for impressions i was i was in shock because i came to the conclusion that wow it's very possible we connected with this guy and we actually helped hopefully we helped to convince him to do the right thing as far as uh, as far as his brother goes so that's how that turned out and uh, i also i worked several many other uh, famous terrorism cases that were in in the public venue so there's no problem with talking about uh, the 93 World Trade Center bombing when four bombers tr almost took down the World Trade Center. And then, of course, 2001, when the actual uh, World Trade Center uh, terrorist attacks did take down the World Trade Center and destroy them. You know, I worked all those cases. And so there's many, many things that are in the public domain that everybody knows about. And that's fine for fine for uh, agents to talk about. That's that's how that goes. I don't want you or expect you to give up details because I know you've got a certain level that you need to do to protect yourself. But I, I'm just curious. When it comes to things like 9-11, there are so many aspects of the story that seem conspiratorial. Mm -hmm. When yeah. you as a special investigator are looking into something like a case like 9-11, and there are hints and whiffs that it might be tied into a form of domestic terrorism and that maybe we had a hand in it. Are, are, do you have to just go about trying to find an answer period, or do you have to go about trying to find an answer that you're pointed to in, in, you, you know where I'm going with this? If they tell sure. you, no, 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 sure. It's Al Qaeda. This is what you need to focus on. John Al Qaeda, right. Or, or, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden, that's our directive. Yeah. Is that where you're forced to go, or are you still seeking, you know, uh, alternative methods and thoughts behind what might have actually occurred? 
Well, both are true. Like, for instance, in the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center, it's very it's very easy to go with the conventional investigation of where it leads you because that material is there. It's there, and there's and there is, of course, uh, all the uh, breadcrumbs and and clues concerning the conventional wisdom of what was involved with 9-11 so that all has to be that all has to be investigated out all the way always it's always the case but then you know that when there's always there's always clues that are outside the uh conventional wisdom uh paradigm when you see things that are just not quite fitting uh then you have to you do look at those also but ultimately how, how reluctant are you to if you're investigating 9-11 and it starts to look like there might have been some government involvement. How reluctant are you to be the guy to say, hey, this looks off to your higher ups? Or, uh, you know, are you encouraged to kind of just turn a blind eye when it could be something embarrassing to our people in our, our own country? Well, no, you always are able to speculate and bring speculations to higher ups and discuss those. But if the speculations don't lead to something solid, I mean, there's not much you can do with it. And one of the main one of the themes I have in my in my book, especially my first book uh, and um, and. Dave, I should have told you this ahead of time, but you know, usually when I come on shows for the first time, my first impression shows, I uh, usually end up discussing my first book, The Power Investigators, more because that's what has my origins in, in paranormal and so forth. But one of the things that one of the main themes of my my first book, The Power Investigators, is that people give way too much credit to national government, uh, not just our national government, but all the national governments. And, you know, all the breadcrumbs that I see in something like, for instance, like 9-11 and other, other places too, other major, major acts of terrorism. One of the things that I see is I see uh, what, uh, what Dr. Richard Dolan, the great Dr. Richard Dolan referred to as next level technology from some kind of breakaway civilization. And what I see in 9-11 that really stands out to me is I don't I don't really see anything that the national government has accomplished or that may have done secretly. I don't see that at all. I see I see basically some clues that could possibly tie to technology that we just don't have that this nation doesn't have and that no other nation has things that come from what I call epic, uh, the elite powers in control, the global government, which really isn't government at all. It's just a system of control. And I see I see little breadcrumbs of possible technology, like the way the towers came down uh, and the way the way that these planes were were guided to these incredibly difficult targets by something I, and uh, by something that possibly may not have been, you know, may not have been some people who took a few classes in, in steering planes, but may have been something that was a level of technology that we just don't have. You know, when you look at these planes uh, and if you talk to some, talk to some pilots about how difficult it would have been to have these planes hit these perfect targets dead on in the middle of a sea of buildings and skyscrapers. It's like, uh, like just imagine, imagine, uh, driving a, driving a, a motorcycle through a forest, a thick forest, uh, and you've got two trees with big yellow X's on them, you know, somewhere deep in the forest. And imagine how hard it would be to be driving that, those motorcycles at top speed and hit one specific tree at going at top speed in that forest would be almost impossible. So many, I so many well, trees in the way. Look at, looking at things, though, John. I mean, you know, I've seen plenty of movies where they show the New York skyline and they, yeah. you know, they fly you out over along the 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 um, borders there, and you could see the the whole city kind of lay out in front of you. It doesn't seem like it would be that hard to fly into those buildings. They were tall. They were centrally located. Uh, you know, and again, maybe I'm, I'm getting a different perspective, but just from what I've seen on TV and in movies with the exposure of those buildings, yeah. they seem to be easy targets. And and your, air, your your airport isn't that far. So bringing a plane out, swinging it around and coming in, it, w- it would seem like that would have. And I think that's why it wasn't it. Um, 
not was it John Grisham? No, Tom Clancy. Didn't he mention yes. that as one of his attacks in one of his books? Yeah, that's right. He did it several years before it happened. Right. And on in his though, it was probably a little easier. It would have been much easier because in his book, he actually illustrated taking an airliner and hitting it into the Capitol building. It was a Capitol building, I believe, when both sessions of Congress would have been there and doing something and so forth. So that's a building that's kind of on its own, not in the middle of a, of a sort of a, a sea of skyscrapers and buildings. But yeah, but that's a discussion that you really have to talk with pilots about, like I have, mm -hmm. about airspeed and, and actually, you know, yeah, it seems like it would be easy, but now try not being a professional pilot uh, with, you know, 20 years experience and then doing that, being able to do that. It's right. very low probabilities on that. That's that's my point. Well, so anyway, right. Going, going into this and, and, and looking at the cases that you do look at as um, an FBI investigator, were there stories and, and cases that you came across that did have an extra dimensional or extra terrestrial vibe to them. I mean, because you guys work on terrorism, I would guess the reason the FBI would be called in on UFOs would be because you don't know if it's some form of terrorism that could be in the sky. Is it a, a foreign uh, organization's planes or, or uh, um, flying objects that are, are getting ready to attack? So would that be why the FBI would be involved in a case like that? Sometimes it would, but I can tell you about my first great experience of the of the paranormal in sure. during during time of law enforcement, which affected not only me but many many law enforcement officers across the country. And it was it was the uh, the story that I give that I tell in my book, The Power Investigators, which is the story of the nine eleven Indigo Kids, it connected right to what we were talking about right now, the nine eleven terrorist attacks, because. In the weeks and about the, the month before 9-11 happened, what was going on was that there were little kids, uh, like ages from four, as young as four, to about 11, 11 or 12 years old, little kids all across the country who were having visions and uh, dreams and experiences, uh, supernatural experiences of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And this was happening all over. And it was, and I can give you some examples. We had a, we had a little boy who was creating a, creating this beautiful uh, finger painting, let's say in his class. And the teacher came over and she said, Oh, those are very lovely. These two buildings that are glowing and it looks like there's angels that are flying be these big red wings away from the buildings. Where are the angels going to? And the little boy said to the teacher uh, that those buildings aren't glowing. They're on on fire and those aren't angels with wings those are people who are on fire and they're jumping out of the buildings so a teacher would walk away from a kid like that and just right. chalk it up too much sugar too much whatever uh, in his uh, diet uh, and we had other examples like a little girl who's on a playground and she's by herself, just sitting by herself, looking down at the dirt and teacher uh, caretaker comes over to her and uh, asks her if she's okay. And she says, I'm fine. I'm just thinking. And the teacher goes to walk away and the little girl pulls violently on her skirt and tells her, warns her next day, stay away from tall buildings because tall buildings fall down sometimes and they fall down on people. And uh, we had, uh, uh, again, teacher just walks away, doesn't think about that again. But then we have another little boy, for instance, who uh, wakes up yelling, uh, falls asleep on a school bus because apparently just fell asleep because uh, he didn't sleep enough the night before. Wakes up uh, from a nap, I guess, uh, just yelling about buildings on fire and people jumping out of buildings, you know, and school bus driver has to check on the child, see if it's okay. Now, these people didn't think twice about these, well, not very much about these incidents until 9-11 actually happened. Uh, the terrorist attacks on 9-11 happened. And then there was a big campaign for see something, say something, anything at all. It doesn't matter how how tenuous, how little the, the uh, connection might be. You have to report. 
support uh, this sort, anything that could be connected to terrorism at this time. So all of these caretakers, I mean, not usually the parents, but caretakers, babysitters and so forth, v- reported these incidents. And law enforcement officers had to go interview these kids and talk to them about no matter how young they were. And uh, even if they felt ridiculous, they, we, there was a 100 percent coverage policy on these interviews. They had to be spoken to and they had to be interviewed, of course, with their parents, of course, right. because because the the thinking was anything that could possibly be connected to terrorism, just in case these kids uh, had uh, got an impression from the parents who may possibly. And that's why the dream and the vision was all about, because oh, maybe they sure. heard something from their parents who may be involved with terrorism. So all of these had to be washed out. That's what we call it, washing what a, out. What an it, interesting perspective, right? Suddenly it goes from these kids that have mythical powers um, yes. and, and seeing the future to yep. were they overhearing mom and dad right. even in their sleep discussing right. these attacks and, and, yes. and setting this wheel in motion. Uh, exactly. Wow, what a great psychological aspect to, uh, to yeah. take into consideration. Exactly. And that's because uh, the, the purely material interpretation always has to be applied in law enforcement. That's just the way it is. That's the nature of no matter how strong the paranormal element may be, it has to be ignored and it has to be proceeded with in a material way. And that's it. And that's why. You know, there's other there's other experiences uh, that I write about of uh, of psychics coming in, let's say, to a major metropolitan uh, police station, and asking, "Where's the detective area? Where's the missing persons uh, person?" Uh, and they would just go to a, go to a sort of a pool, and they would say, and they would say, "You know, I'm a psychic, so forth. I, I have an impression of a dead body of a young girl at this and this specific location at this." latitude this longitude go there you will find blah 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 you will find this find that and you'll have the lead investigator standing up and saying oh okay this is very very good stuff and then taking down all the information and you'll have uh you'll have uh, the whole all the information taken on the psychic individual and then the uh, lead investigator will be okay we're ready to go out to this location you'll have and you'll have a supervisor who also heard the exchange come over and say, uh, no, our first step has to be to do a back full background on the psychic and find out how this person is probably connected to the murder of this individual and just bring everything to a stop. Bring everything to a stop uh, where instead of going out searching and looking for this body at the specific location, everything is stopped because the purely material interpretation has to take precedence over everything else. Doesn't and that so, seem to fly in the, in the face of sensibility, though? Here's the deal. Even if, let's say, uh, psychic medium Dave Schrader comes into the FBI and I say, I want to speak to Special Agent John D'Souza. I think I know something about this missing child. And they bring me to you, and I right. tell you that I'm having these psychic premonitions. Wouldn't it make more sense that while you have me there, you, you take me, I show you the spot, Yes. Then once you put me in that spot and and then start to de-evolve the story, because yes. it, it seems to me that doing it the other way, if if I was involved in trying to come off like a hero and now I realize yeah. you guys may be investigating me, yeah. I might go move that body. I might go change up the parameters of the investigation because I realize, oh, this isn't going to go well, and I'd much rather be a, a wackadoo medium who was wrong than turn the light on myself as as this. Um, exactly. Why Why do exactly. they step in the way of, of that progression? Because, John, I mean, and again, I'm not an investigator. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just fascinated by investigative shows. But it seems like if you have a tip, the first duty is to the victim and the family let's find this person exactly and, and if it takes us out to this old sawmill and we find the body great that part of the equation is done and now as it says right the first 48 hours are important the more information yes. you can get in the shorter amount of time i would think that would that would help solve the case a lot more and it may also help clear the name of the medium quicker because you can say all right listen we we found the body we know it's been dead for two weeks that would put it to around this date well the medium happened to be you know four states away working their day job so now we can immediately eliminate them as the suspect but the important thing is what evidence do we now have that hasn't gone away hasn't washed away hasn't rotted away that we can we can find the real criminal 
Yes. And that's, you stated basically the major theme of my book, The Power Investigators, which is all about uh, investigators who have paranormal abilities, who use those abilities to help people, sometimes to save lives. And a lot of times they are punished for it because law enforcement is completely material based and a lot of law enforcement can't look outside of that area. And it's, uh, and it's, it's kind of, it's not a good thing because it sometimes it victimizes these investigators who go outside of the material in order to sometimes to save lives. And I can give you so many examples that I, that I put in my book. Uh, and one of the examples is a story I call death by a broken heart, which is a story that's very, probably well, very well known by well, your let's listeners. Do, let's do this. Uh, death by a broken heart. I'll jot that down so we can come back to it after the break. Um, I do want to uh, follow up with one question before we, we have to take this break and go to the dark sure. hives for a new theater of the mind. But I, I'm curious, uh, with the crystalline children, um, the indigo children from 9-11, yes. what yes. was, once you realized that the, these children were having this experience and, and relating these stories, what is the protocol once that's done and you're able to eliminate their families as having any type of internal involvement in this case? Was it just chalked up to leaving that aspect of the case open on why or how these children knew this detailed of information regarding that attack? That's easy. Uh, 100% of all of these cases of the Indigo children of 9-11, every single one, were washed out. That's what we call it, washed out when you have a clues and, and theories that are that are not that strong and you're able to just wash them out and they were washed out as no connection to terrorism and they were closed with extreme prejudice and uh, locked up and never looked at again and there's no there's no uh, hey let's uh, refer this over to the psychological unit of the psychic research of uh, right. this but uh, none of that no there is none of that and and as they, a matter but do they keep tabs on those kids to find out if those kids uh, continue to have visuals uh, or, or or connections to future events as well not as far as I know as far as I know these are these are places these are and they're only called leads actually mm -hmm. these uh, leads are closed out in every single case and the information is not referred to anyone who could do anything with this because law enforcement is not allowed to conclude that something supernatural went on here they're just they're just not they can't do that they have it's to stay too hard to use them. that in court i understand yeah yeah, and they're not, uh, and they're not allowed to share it based on that either. You see, so that's that's where we're left. That's the uh, that's the final conclusion with these cases. Unfortunately, and the FBI concluded that there was nothing uh, paranormal going on and no connection to terrorism. No, nothing paranormal. Yet these kids were able to visualize, draw, and share, relate stories to something that happened almost exactly. in minute detail. Unbelievable. Exactly. Uh, John D'Souza, our guest this evening. We will continue with him. But first, the vaults of the Darkives continue to call us. We have another real-life experience with E.T. from Tim Haas in this, The Theater of the Mind. I woke to the sound of something moving in my room. Panic immediately set in. I realized I couldn't open my eyes or move my body. I had heard of sleep paralysis and at first thought, maybe this is what I was experiencing. I could hear the sound of my wife gently crying in her sleep, a mixture between a light sob and a breathy cry. I wanted so badly to open my eyes, to check on her, comfort her, but I was frozen in place. My breathing was regular, but I could not move. I could not even open my eyes. That brought forth a sense of terror I had never and have never experienced since. Was I dying? Was I dead and somehow still in my body? unsure how to break free from my physical form? Even through closed eyes, I could tell there was a bright blue light source surrounding me. The sounds of something moving around me continued. Wait, there was more than one thing moving, and I could feel the bed shake slightly, almost vibrating, and my wife's constrained cries started again. A whirring sound, somewhere between the sound of a fan and a small drill, began to hum. I struggled unsuccessfully to open my eyes, to scream, to move. I sensed something lifting off the bed, like my wife had gone, her body no longer next to me. 
I noticed that there was no other sounds around me. Not the grandfather clock down the hall, not the snoring of our dog tugger, nothing. Just that subtle whirring noise. Finally, my eyes began to open, the blue light filling my room and it seemed to be coming from the far right corner. I still couldn't move, but my vision, blurry at first, and straining against the light began to clear, and I quickly wished it hadn't. Hovering above the bed was my wife, as though she was being lifted by an unseen force. What was happening? What kind of hellish dream was I in? My eyes darted to the left of me. That's when I saw them. Three figures standing close to my bed, varying heights, from six feet being the tallest to maybe four feet being the shortest. The tall one leaned over and brought his face to within inches of my own. His large, glassy, unblinking eyes gazed into mine. Then it spoke. Without moving its mouth, I could hear it say, Stop struggling. The voice was a mix of mechanical and a man. Then it spoke again. We will leave here soon. My eyes began to well up with tears as I saw other beings on my wife's side of the bed, their long spindly fingers running over her body. They looked at each other. I could hear a muted conversation, but couldn't make out the words. Like listening to a loud party from a few rooms away, I could hear them talk without understanding the things they said. Ronnie's body began to shudder, slowly at first, and then more violently as she hung there, suspended above the bed. Her sobs began to get louder as she shook mid-air. This seemed to concern the beings surrounding my bed. They moved quickly to her side, all of them, and she began to lower to the bed. The thing that caught my attention as she gradually lowered was that her long, pretty brown hair didn't just hang behind her. It seemed to flow like she was underwater and it swayed gently like being led by the waves. When she finally touched down, her body stopped moving, completely stopped. My heart felt like it froze in my chest. Oh my God, had these things just murdered my wife in front of me? That was when the tall one swiftly moved around the bed and stood beside me. He bent down and his face stared into mine once more, and his voice filled my head once again. She is unharmed. She will not remember a thing. Neither will you. It extended its finger and tapped me on the forehead between my eyes while it repeated some gibberish. <laughs> Like a strange incantation, my body relaxed and I was free to move. I sprung up onto my bed and yelled. The large one snatched his arm out and caught me by my throat. He dragged me to his face and with his hairless brow furrowed, his mouth grimaced and revealed the pointy, horrifying teeth within and his voice hissed in my head. Be quiet. I fought against his grasp, but to no avail. I was locked in his grip. I kicked, and with his free arm, he batted back my attack like the backhand to a mosquito. He slammed me hard into the bed and again hovered ominously over my face and insisted, Be quiet. The other figures moved around my wife while Ronnie laid there motionless, lifeless, and they poked and prodded her while I lay there helpless under the grasp of this surreal intruder. The blue light began to shift more to a white light. I could not see what was causing it. it. It almost seemed to be pouring through an unseen door. Finally, the beings, one by one, faded into the light door, leaving the big one holding me down and the littlest one. The little one dug its finger into my thigh and scratched me. The pain was muted at first and then replaced by a deep, stinging, burning sensation. The large one continued to stare menacingly and almost snarl at me. Then the little one ran into the light source and was gone. Finally, the odds seemed more in my favor as the big one was all that was left. He ran his finger across its slit of a mouth and a hissing noise came forth, like a mechanical It let go of me and turned to approach the lighted doorway. I jumped up again. There was no way I was going to let this murdering thing leave my room and I jumped towards it. Without even looking back, it swung its arm back at me and brushed me aside like a gnat, sending me crashing into the closet doors and through them. I lay there in pain as it strode to the light. It turned to me, and its large eyes narrowed. Its brow knitted in a disapproving stare, and it spoke inside my head again and left me with this. We have been here before. We will return again. And next time, if you struggle like you did tonight, you will never see this place or the people you love again. Understand, 
We are always here, always watching, and we are in control. Then it backed into the light, and with an electrical buzzing noise filling the air, the light blinked out, and the room was silent. As I tried to steady myself to stand, the broken closet door shifted and crashed down further. My wife popped up in bed and cried out, What the hell did you do? I tried to explain the things I saw and witnessed. She insisted I was dreaming and that the long bloody scratch on my leg was from sleep running into the closet door. I'd never and have never walked in my sleep. I still have no idea where these things come from or where they went. But on certain nights, my cats will stare into the corner of that room, making strange, long, creepy meowing sounds that they never make any time or anywhere else in the house. It raises the hair on my neck and arms every time. We're not alone. I can't say these things are from outer space, but I can say I believe, and I'm scared as hell. This is Beyond the Darkness. I want to thank all of our great listeners out there because you guys not only support our show, but you're supporting the people that advertise on our show. We get a chance to pick those advertisers, whether it's HelloFresh or Harry's Razors or our favorite, which is True Car. They're here with us all the time. I'm getting letters now, emails from you, the listeners, telling me about your experiences. Please keep them coming. Dave at darknessradio.com is the way to reach out to me. And we've been talking about this for a few weeks now. True car was brought to my attention for my father who wanted me to start to build my own confidence level up in getting a car. Yeah, I'm going to be 50 this year. I'm not great when it comes to vehicles. I know where to put the gas in order to put the key and everything else I leave to the experts. Well, it's about time I take control of that because when I have to get a new vehicle, I always feel overwhelmed. You go on the slot, you're talking to fast talkers, you know, they've got a, a certain amount they have to make. They're pushing, they're doing their deal. And, and that puts a lot of pressure on you. And then you want to make sure that you're getting the best deal on the best vehicle for you, not the deal that they have to get rid of off of their lot that week where they're going to get a bonus. So true car is what my dad introduced to me. And it is fantastic when you're looking to buy a car new or used, and you want to make sure you're getting real pricing on actual inventory. Uh, this is, this is the product you want to use true car will help you out they have check this out three million cars that have been sold over thirteen thousand dealers and over seven hundred thousand pre-owned vehicles available and you're getting an average savings of over three thousand dollars off the manufacturer suggested retail price uh, i got an email from aaron mason who is a listener to the show said he heard us talking about it after a couple of days he decided to check it out uh took advantage of true car signed up and he made his first purchase and feels great because he realized he was going to pay almost four thousand dollars more for a vehicle until he used true car that's where the substantial help comes in using true car you can easily find the car you want next you're going to be able to use true car to find out what other people in your area paid for the same car you're looking for now you know what the fair price is going to be and you can feel confident when you're making this purchase and with over three million vehicles that have already been sold to true car users by the true car certified dealer network you have the confidence to go in knowing you're going to be taken care of there are over 13,000 true car certified dealers nationwide and you work directly with a true car certified dealer contact in order to make this purchase true car users are more likely to enjoy a faster buying process when they connect with true car certified dealers and true car users save an average pay attention again folks an average of three thousand dollars off of manufacturer suggested retail pricing that's phenomenal that can pay your entire year of car insurance it can pay an entire year of gasoline for that car so why wouldn't you take advantage of it when you're ready to buy make sure you visit true car T-R-U-E-C-A-R, all one word. Visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. And I'm going to be doing it when my son and I go looking for cars this uh, next fall. Uh, Tim's going to be doing it when he replaces his beast that's about to uh, drop dead. Why not take advantage of it? Do like Aaron Mason. Go investigate it for yourself and make sure when you go make that next purchase, you save yourself some money, you get the confidence back, you get the uh, feeling that you know you're being handled well, and now you know what other people are paying for the same kind of car in your area. Check out True Car when you get ready to make your next purchase for new or used. And remember, by doing that, 
and letting them know you heard about it here on Beyond the Darkness, that's going to go a long way to keep this show on the air. When you support our advertisers, it helps to keep this show available to you. And we love doing this show, so make sure you keep up with us that way. And remember, another great way to do it is visit Amazon.com by uh, our website. Go to Podcast One. Dot com. Click on the Killer Deals link, and then you'll see our banner for Beyond the Darkness. Click on that banner. You'll see our advertisers there, including Amazon. Anything you need to buy off Amazon.com, use those links, whether you're in the United States, the U.K., or Canada. Use the right corresponding link, because when you make a purchase using those links, a small portion of the sale goes a long way to help keep this show on the air and keep our operating costs down. So that helps us, and I'm getting emails all the time from you guys, so thank you for the support. So many of you are using the Amazon.com link from the Killer Deals section. You can bookmark that link, so you can always go back to it. It's the largest shopping mall in the world world, everything and anything you need is right there from ghost hunting equipment to binoculars, night vision, binoculars, clothing, food, uh, books, all the great authors you hear, you can go ahead and get it. Now, here's the great part. You don't pay anything extra. It's not like you're paying to help us go on. If something's $20 on Amazon.com, you're going to pay $20 using the Killer Deals link as well. A small portion of that goes to help our show and pay for all of the extra costs. So it's just that simple, just that easy. Make it a part of your buying routine and help us out. It goes a long way to doing that. Uh, one other thing I do want to mention to you. We uh, still have just a few available slots for our August England trip. We're doing the Darkness Radio Beyond the Darkness British Invasion First Wave this August. August. I'm going to be taking Neil's story as our tour guide, and uh, you've heard him on our show numerous times on Darkness Radio and on Beyond the Darkness. Neil will be our official tour guide as we travel throughout England, visiting some of the most amazing spots. We'll get to see Jack the Ripper. We'll get to hear about Dracula's ex- adventures in England. Uh, from the book, you'll get to see some of the spots that are talked about. Plus, we'll get to see haunted castles, haunted crypts, jails. You mention it. We're going to go check it out. And did I mention we're going to Nottingham? That's that's right. We're going to also investigate Haunted Nottingham right out there. Sherwood Forest, Robin Hood. Man, you get all of this great stuff. Plus a stop at Hogwarts. That's right. The real castle that they used in the Harry Potter movies. We'll get to stop in there and get to check out all the cool stuff going on. It's going to be one of the best foreign adventures. Our trip that we set up to go in September sold out in 18 hours. 18 hours. Bam. We had to open up the second trip so we could accommodate more people. So come on, go get information at darknessevents.com. Darknessevents.com and begin your lifetime of adventure with the adventure of a lifetime with your buddies here from Darkness Radio. Me, Neil Story, we're going to be going out there. We want you to join us in this August to do that. Now, if you want to stay a little bit closer to home, we're also going to be going out uh, to the uh, Belvoir Winery, the Odd Fellows Asylum. You've seen it on Ghost Hunters. You've seen it on Ghost Adventures and uh, Ghost Adventures Aftershocks. We're going to be going out there in July to investigate with Chris Fleming, the psychic medium sensitive, and Bill Chappell, the technology guru to the paranormal. We're going to go out and get a chance to investigate over a weekend. You'll get to hear some live talks. You get to interact with the investigators. You get to meet the owners and get a chance to see one of the coolest locations and one of the most active domestic locations I've had a chance to visit, the Odd Fellows Asylum in Missouri. So go sign up, become members of that right now with us at Darkness Events. Dot com darkness events.com you can find all the information on all these trips and more where we will be around the united states and around the world this year our guest tonight john de souza is here with us the x-man he is um a former FBI special agent investigator with over 20 years of experience collecting real-life X-Files. He's the uh, best-selling author of The Extra Dimensionals. And I know we've been talking about more of his first book and his experiences of getting into this. We're going to delve deeper into his book, The Extra Dimensionals, True Tales and Concepts of Alien Visitors, as the show progresses. But before we do that, uh, you teased us with a little story I had to stop you short on earlier, John, um, from your first book. Let's talk about death by a broken heart. Uh, John D'Souza, our guest, thank you for being here. Yes. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, like I was saying, uh, we were talking about uh, investigators who have supernatural abilities that uh, that coincides with my first book, The Power Investigators, True Tales and Concepts of Supernaturally Gifted Investigators. And we we're talking about how tragic it is when investigators go outside the material paradigm and look at things that explain 
what is really going on in certain cases. And very often they are rejected. They can be even vilified for what they do, even though sometimes they save lives. And anyway, uh, in my book, The uh, Death by a Broken Heart is a story of a of a guy who's like an hourly security guard, uh, this uh, man named Richard Jewell, who was in 2004, was at the uh, Olympic Park in, uh, I believe it was Atlanta, Georgia, you know, Centennial Olympic Park. He was a, he was a guy who never, no one ever would have took, taken for a hero. He was an hourly security guard. He was a, a paunchy guy with a Southern drawl, uh, who, tried to get into several police departments and never his applications never really went through. Uh, but on this one night, on this one night in 2004, he became the greatest investigator who ever lived because what happened was uh, he was patrolling this, uh, this park, Olympic Park Village at the time, which it was late at night, but the Olympic events had let out and the place was streaming, streaming with hundreds, thousands of people going through these walkways in the park and they were everywhere and it was very, very crowded with people. Uh, families, kids, uh, there was even media in the park, uh, uh, mainstream media reporters who were interviewing uh, athletes at the time. So anyway, it was extremely packed. But on this particular night, uh, he spotted uh, this giant hiking pack, one of these big hiking packs where you put you put everything you've got in those things. And they're like, it can be as big as five feet tall and very, very heavy. And it was abandoned in the middle of a walkway where there are dozens and hundreds of people were streaming right by this pack uh, on both sides. And like I said, he became the greatest investigator in the world because every every security guard would have just hauled that thing into lost and found or hauled it over to uh, su- supervisors to get what to do next. What he did instead was he took police tape. And he set up a perimeter around that suspicious package. He declared it a suspicious package and he set up police tape around it. And then he started shooing people away from the area, not just the inner perimeter, but the outer perimeter as well. And he advised his superiors uh, on the radio and he just was was trying to get people to get away from this package because like I said, it was a very crowded, very crowded night. And there were just, there were just thousands of people in that park walking all over the place. And he began to use his body. He began to get desperate to to get people further and further away from this thing, this suspicious package, which he decided was very suspicious. And he started using his body. He started, uh, his voice rose from normal yelling to a shrill, just screaming where he just started. And he was on camera this entire time because people were taking videos of him as well as of course the regular surveillance cams that were going on. And he was becoming more and more desperate. And eventually this, this package exploded and it caused, it caused because of what he was doing, it caused minimal casualties. Whereas if he had not done what he did, it could have been 50 to 100 people uh, killed or injured instead of what actually happened. So he was hailed as a hero right after this, this occurred. Did and, they also turn the tables on him, though, and then think yeah. that maybe he had some involvement in this? Yeah, because, and here's why. Uh, investigators on the ground there uh, who were looking at this, uh, looking at these videos that I just told you about, uh, they uh, kept on looking at these videos of him uh, getting more and more desperate and screeching at people and using his body to get people out of the outer perimeter of this package. And one thing became apparent to them, the same thing that became apparent to me as I viewed those videos at a later date, uh, it was that he knew it was a bomb. And he did. Now, investigators on the ground uh, could only conclude that the only way he could have possibly, because he didn't look inside the, he was on camera the entire time. He did never looked inside the package. Of course, he didn't, didn't do that. So their final conclusion was the only way he could know it was a bomb was that he planted the bomb. Mm. My conclusion was very different. I concluded that the 
way that he knew it was a bomb was because he had some ability to remote view. He had a vision. He had some supernatural way that he looked inside that that package, and that's how he knew. That was my conclusion, but it was very different from the investigators on the ground who said he's the bomber. And basically that went all over all over the world. The media picked it up. They loved the uh, narrative of, you know, failed uh, law enforcement guy, you know, wanting to be a hero. And so for 88 days, they basically ruined his life. They destroyed his life and declared him to be the bomber. And it was uh, it was a terrible, terrible thing. Um, and it was the only case I've ever seen where the, uh, the U.S. attorney had to come forward and make a statement at the end of 88 days that he was unjustly, unjustly accused of being the bomber, unjustly looked at, I should say, uh, as a person of interest in being the bomber, possibly. So he was then it was basically an apology to him. But it was too late. His, his life was ruined and law enforcement went after him also. Uh, people he had admired for so long, people who he had held in the highest regard for so long, uh, they they basically went after him. And that's uh, and it was just it was just too bad because, like I said, he he ended up, of course, going to court and winning some big awards against the uh, media who unjustly, unjustly accused him. But it was too late. I mean, he was he died a short time later. You know, and I always maintain that he died of a broken heart uh, when he was asked how he was asked repeatedly later on. Uh, how did you know? Uh, how did you know that it was a bomb? All he would say, and he never went beyond this, all he would ever say is, I just knew. I just knew. And he did, because if you go listen to those tapes, I, I think those may be available on public databases today. But if you go and you listen to those tapes, you can tell in his voice. You can tell he knew it was a bomb. So that's, you know, that's in keeping with the tragic circumstance of investigators who use those abilities and and my book the power investigator is filled with examples like that of of investigators who use abilities sometimes abilities they didn't even know they had until right. that moment until that moment and they use them to save lives and yet because people don't understand the manner in which they save their lives uh, they are sometimes reviled they are sometimes reviled and made to suffer because of how they use their abilities and it's just it's a tragic thing it's a tragic thing because sometimes all they're trying to do is help people and keep people safe. Right. And they're using this God-given gift, if you will, exactly. to try to make a difference. And in some cases, it blows up extremely bad. Well, you can understand why some mediums and psychics are afraid to come forward with information yeah. or are reluctant to do so. Uh, the book so, I wanted to dip into for the remainder of the show, um, and it, certainly we've got so many stories, we're going to need to bring you back here and, and uh, <laughs> talk, dip into more of your stories and, and questions as well. But let's talk about the extra dimensionals, true mm -hmm. tales and concepts of alien visitors. First of all, give me your description. What does extra dimensionals mean to you? Extra dimensionals means to me that alien visitors are very possibly, and this is a, this is a investigative conclusion I came to after so many cases uh, that I've looked at, that I've investigated witnesses on alien abductions, on just contact cases, observation cases, and it is the central theme that very possibly alien visitors are not physical at all. Instead, they are from other dimensions of they are real, they are real and they are visiting the earth. They are making contact with humans on a regular basis. And that phenomenon is only growing all the time. Uh, however, they are most likely not physical in a permanent sense. And for some reason, they are not able to achieve permanent physicality in a permanent sense either. They are instead from other dimensions. They are able to create their vibra change their vibratory rate and appear to be physical and the same goes for the ufo ships for the these uh sh these vehicles that uh, people see which i call plasmas they are also not completely physical now they can achieve physicality for short periods of time but they cannot maintain it permanently that's what extra dimensionals means it's addressing the same alien visitors that everybody else addresses also but 
with a new, with a different view, with a different uh, conclusion on their ex- on how they exist and how they come here and where they go back to. So you because don't believe that when they when we see these aliens, you don't believe that that's an actual physical being. Is it more of like a projection from an alternate universe, a parallel dimension? Partially, partially, yes. You can you can put it that way. But yes, they are able. I believe that the, both in UFOs and the alien visitors themselves, they are able to achieve physicality in our universe, like we like we are physical for very brief periods of time. That's what I've seen. That's my final conclusion on their existence. But they are not able to maintain that physicality for very long, and they are not able to keep it permanent. That's that's what I'm saying. Now, when you look around, right. uh, when you look around on the moon and on Mars, for instance, we we can see when we get the the photos that are not doctored by NASA, we can see evidence of civilization structures and things that that show that there was there was a time, and even here on Earth, uh, we, from the megalithic structures throughout the Earth that could not have been done with human technology, we can see that there was a time when they were, when alien visitors were here on a pretty much a semi, a pretty much a permanent basis, more or less. And so there was a time in the past, maybe before the recorded history of of humankind, that they did have this problem solved. They were able to be here more or less permanently. But something's changed. Something is different in the modern era. And I believe they can't do that today they cannot be permanently physical in our in our universe at this time and i don't know exactly what has changed but something has john what opened you up to the idea of these extra dimensional craft and beings did you have your own experience or was it simply in the collection of stories that you've heard and collected for all these years oh uh both are true. Uh, I did have my own experiences when I was a child, uh, and I can go into that. But, but first, what I want to tell you is that the whole extra-dimensional hypothesis came to me, <laughs> interestingly enough, came to me through an FBI document that I that I perused, that I studied very carefully, and that was amazing and its central theme is that alien visitors are not physical they are from other dimensions and they are here only temporarily and it's a document that i can share with everybody right this second anybody who's uh, googling me it is on uh, it is at vault.fbi.gov and anyone can go to that. That is the repository. You might be familiar with this repository. Uh, it's the repository of FBI documents have been declassified over the years um, under Freedom of Information Acts, and they're just dumped onto the internet under that. Do that again that, for me. It's vault. Vault. The word vault. You know, V A U L T, like Tom. Dot FBI. Dot gov. G O V. And at that. Web address is the is basically the dumping ground archive uh, for all uh, FBI documents that are available for everybody right. to down, download at their at their leisure. They're all free, and anyone can get them. Now, if you go to that address on the right side, are all the subjects. Now, this this uh, place has unexplained phenomena on the right side under all the subheadings and you can click on unexplained phenomena and I'll tell you there's there's documents in here that are in thousands thousands of documents there's documents on JFK assassination there's documents on cattle mutilations there's documents on various uh, unexplained phenomena so you click on unexplained phenomena on the right side and then on the left side uh, you can click on UFOs, UFOs, and you click on UFOs, and there's going to be various groups of documents. On the first document, it says 1947, and you can, of course, Roswell is under there. There's many, many documents on Roswell, New Mexico, uh, alien crash. They have on there the Guy Hotel memo, which is a very well-known document, a very famous document, uh, which is basically an FBI supervisor named Guy Hotel or Hotel, I'm not sure you pronounce that, who wrote to J. Edgar Hoover 
1947, he said to him, and he's, this document just says, hey, uh, this is real. There was a, there was an alien vehicle crash in Roswell, New Mexico, and the Air Force is all over it, and we need to get moving on this. We need to send people, we need to look into it, and we need to treat it like it's a real thing because the military and the Air Force are treating it like it's a real thing. So we need to get moving and go look at it also. And there's possibly a couple of bodies there, I believe he says, also. So that's a very famous document. However, there's a document that's even more famous than that. And it is, uh, you, uh, you click on the uh, UFOs, then you click on the first group of documents. It starts in 1947, and there is a document called a memorandum of importance i call it the smoking gun document it is uh, dated july 1947 and it is it is a memorandum of importance that is uh, a document from an, an unnamed fbi supervisor who has phd he's a former scientist and he's writing a memo out to the scientific community it says on there and it says he has a source he has a, an informant can't give the name of the informant, but he says what kind of informant it is on there. At the top, it says, he says, and this is, sorry, this is page 22 of the first group of documents under UFO headings. If you go to that first group, click on that, and you go to page 22. That's where Memorandum of Importance, dated July 8th, 1947, is. And then he gives about seven or eight conclusions, and these conclusions are from his source, who he says is supernormal, which is just an old-timey word for supernatural or paranormal. And he says, the scientists are probably not going to listen to what I have to say because of the kind of source I have. And for me, for me, it seems kind of, it seems kind of clear that his source is an ET. It is an extra dimensional being, because if you look at the conclusions, that's the only type of person that, that this source could be because the first thing he says in these conclusions is they're not physical they the alien visitors are extra dimensional they are from other dimensions they are not from our time and space they are not physical they are not cramming themselves into little metal shells and sailing across the galaxies like we would because they're not humans they're not like humans that's something humans would do and they are instead in another dimension they change their vibratory rate to travel from there and he calls them locus locus is a v old vedic term an ancient vedic term that means dimensions of reality levels of reality that do not intersect with each other and he says they are in a separate locus talas also is another word he uses and they are changing their vibratory rate to match our vibratory rate and therefore they appear to us in our in our physicality for periods of time then he also says ufos the ufos are not not made of metal despite their appearance they're they're plasmas they're made out of a plasmic type material light like a light that changes form and is able to change form to various things another thing he says is those things are empty. He says, UFOs, there's nobody inside. They are remote, when, in the words he uses, is remotely controlled somehow. And they accompany alien visitors, but they are not containing the alien visitors. And he also says uh, their level of technology is so tremendous that we cannot, we cannot uh, challenge them with our Air Force in the air, because that would be a tragic, tragic mistake to do that. Uh, because their technology is just so far advanced from ours that they could very easily uh, destroy uh, destroy our our air defenses and any of our any challenge that we would put to to their vehicles in the air. Uh, shortly shortly after that, I would contend that Admiral Byrd and his Navy flotilla found out exactly that when they went to Antarctica to uh, to try to attack the uh, the Nazi base. New Swabenland that was supposedly set up in Antarctica, and they were uh, they were supposedly they were attacked by UFOs, and it was went very very badly for them. John, uh, so, are, are, do, does our government look at these as real threats? These extra dimensional beings and craft, or are they just like oh, you know, uh, 
ducks and and geese sometimes gum up the engines of planes and they cause issues. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do they look at it as just it's it's just phenomena that we can't control? But they're it's not like they've got nefarious intentions for us. Right. Well, they can't control it. Um, one of the things that I uh, that I go into is uh, something I call the carpet stain doctrine, which is the doctrine that government agencies are assigned a certain assignment. They are given that assignment. Uh, like, for instance, NASA has the assignment to control and monitor the space around the Earth, you know, the outer space atmosphere around the Earth. And that is their carpet stain. That is what they are in charge of. And the one thing that they don't want you to know is that they are not in control of their carpet stain. They really aren't because these UFOs uh, that they do not know about and that they have no knowledge of keep appearing at will wherever they want and keep on going wherever they want and they just don't know what they are and they do not want the real truth to be out that they're not in control they're just not and if you want to know what i mean just google nasa cuts the live feed <laughs> just google that and go look at all the examples of of ufos that are unknown to nasa that keep appearing during the live feed the live feed of their projection from satellites. Now, and John, let, me, let me ask you this. As an FBI agent yeah. and an investigator, yeah. you have to have corroborative evidence. You have to have yeah. something physical that you can look at. I've seen some of the video feed. Some of the video feed looks like um, crystal uh, things that are just floating past the window that perspective makes it look larger than it is. Uh, some have some very interesting looking yeah. uh, pieces. We're also going to see rocks and debris that are floating yeah. through and, and always coming into our atmosphere and can create a, a true yeah. UFO experience because it is unidentified and it's flying and it's coming through our skyline, but it's probably nothing yeah. more than space garbage. How do you, yeah. uh, how do you differentiate between the crap and the real stuff? Oh, it's only through very careful examination uh, and you know, there's does. I'm not talking about one or two incidents anyway. I'm, when you, when you Google right. uh, NASA cuts the live feed, uh, there are dozens of examples of these, and some are more stark and real than others. Of course, uh, I would I would ask everybody to look go look at the uh, tether, the tether event that happened uh, with the um, with the space station, the space station tether event. Just, just go look at when that tether uh, was holding, conducting electricity, and it came loose. And many, many, uh, it's, I believe it's called the uh, ISS, International Space Station a Tether Event. And that tether came loose, sticking out straight into space, like for 12 miles, I believe, for several miles, because uh, it was such a long tether. And all of these vehicles just suddenly showed up. And the cover story will always be believable. That's why we use cover stories, because they're believable and they can be believed by those who don't wish to go outside the material. And, yeah, the, the cover story is always, yeah, space, uh, garbage, uh, dust, uh, whatever. But if you go look at the ISS uh, tether event, uh, it's pretty hard, it's pretty difficult to deny that those are vehicles that are showing up to see what happened with the tether. It's uh, really something. But in vain of what you just said, being able to distinguish, here's what I would, here's what I would ask people. And I always ask people to do this. The, my book, The Power Investigators, the first, I would ask them, please go to Amazon, read the free sample of the para investigator that's available where it says look in here uh, just go and read the first 50 pages for free or get the sample downloaded for free of my book the para investigators because the first 50 pages is a primer on what real investigation is and what real evidence means because unfortunately television has trained us not to know what real evidence is we've been trained with uh, things like CSI and all the CSI like uh, programming that's out there that the only thing that's real evidence is stuff that goes into a test tube or that men in white lab coats can measure can compare and can put on a computer screen and nothing could be further from the truth 
the real, the most valuable real evidence that's out there that's demonstrable is anything that can be connected to human authenticity. That anything that we can connect to real people. And if you want to know what I'm talking about, just go look at uh, on, on, uh, on the da- video databases, we still have available the testimony and the interviews with Betty and Barney Hill, for instance. Uh, go look at those interviews. You want to see authenticity. You want to see something that's real. Go listen to, especially uh, Betty, Betty Hill, uh, talking about their abduction experience and what happened to them. And you can hear it in their voice. You can hear it in their in their conduct. You can see that this is very painful, that they're not gaining anything from talking about this. And that's the most valuable kind of evidence, I, I would say, is anything you can connect to that kind of authenticity. See, and they, they were fascinating to me because here you've got a, a, a multiracial couple who would have drawn a lot of attention in ire. And I know they probably wanted to fly under the wire as much as they possibly could. And yet this couple, Betty and Barney Hill, have this extraordinary encounter and come forward, share this information. As you said, it's almost painful because, you know, they're going to take enough guff because of the times and because of the race and interracial yes. marriage that they, they're going to take enough of that. And then to put themselves out there with such a, a claim of lunacy at the time, that had to be extremely hard for them to uh, to come forward with. Yes. Yes, exactly. And so that's why um, in the first 50 pages of my book, I try to I try to open up people's minds to what real evidence, what the most valuable kind of evidence is uh, demonstrable and what's the most valuable kind of truth that's out there. And we need to need to really educate ourselves on what that really means. I mean, if you go also available on, on, on YouTube and all the databases, if you go listen, go look at Travis Walton talking about his experiences uh, with uh, alien abduction, which turns out his his part, his uh, alien abduction is a special case because it wasn't an abduction at all. We now found out there's been new revelations in his case uh, where now we know his case was actually an alien rescue, uh, not an abduction at all. Uh, so that's that's something in and of itself. But Wait a minute. Now, I've, known, I've known him for a long time. <laughs> I've never heard this aspect of the story. Can you enlighten yeah. me? To, where, where did this change come in? All right, let me let me do that. Uh, Travis Walton, for those uh, I'm sure most of your listeners know, was a young man, barely 20 years old, back in 1975, who was in Sitgraves uh, National Park with a logging crew. He was he was um, they were finishing a long, hard day's work, and they were leaving from the forest uh, at the time. Uh, they all piled into a truck, uh, but a UFO plasma showed up uh, above, just above the tree lines in a clearing, and it was up there. It was filled with light. It was filled with light, uh, and it was. I mean, you could barely see any sort of metal because it was so bright, giving off so much light. Well, Travis gets the bright idea. He's going to run underneath this this vehicle, this thing. He runs under there, and he, of course, uh, the sounds. He said it sounds like the uh, vehicle was getting ready to take off, sort of like a humming, like a sort of repressed humming, and a, a bolt of well, you could call it a bolt of lightning, struck him, and apparently it struck him down dead apparently because everyone looking said it looked like he was dead and he himself now says likely likely that he was dead and he went to the ground and his his uh, friends peeled out uh, they they got out of there uh, there's a there's another witness in this case who was in the military uh, and again this is this is sort of a recent development, but not really. Uh, there was a, a another witness who was in the forest at the time. He was hunting at that time, even though it was already it was already nighttime. So he was emerging from the forest. And he was with his wife, and he was coming out. And he looked at uh, he looked to his right, and he saw he saw a truck peeling out in the distance. I mean, just getting out of there and filled with guys who kind of appeared to be yelling, uh, but they were, they were taken off. They were gone already. And then he looked to his left and he saw a scene that was a young man who looked like he was being pulled upwards into what appeared to be a ship, a ship that was just hovering above the tree line. And if you go look at my book, The Extra Dimensionals, True Tales and Concepts of Alien Visitors, 
his testimony captured my imagination so much I put it on the cover of my book and it is actually a it is actually a scene that he says he saw of a young man being pulled up and doesn't didn't appear to have any sort of harness or any pressure points. It looked like he was being pulled up from the inside out and floated upward towards this in the beam of light from the ship. He appeared eyes closed, head back. It looked like he may have been unconscious or dead and he was being pulled up. And that scene is on the cover of my book, The Extra Dimensionals. And this this man uh, took polygraphs uh, that he can show right. the, show the truth of where he was and what he was doing at the time, uh, that he was really in that forest and that he really did see what he said he saw. It's fascinating uh, how many of the people that were witnesses that day have passed multi Polygraph exactly. tests. I mean, exactly. And I know that they can, exactly. polygraph tests can be uh, wrong from time to time, but they've been yeah. multi uh, yeah. multi tests, and each right. one is positive. It's just, it never right. breaks down in their story. That's so fascinating. Right. Yeah, and I'm not a big believer in polygraphs, but Travis Walton is because he's passed several. So he's he's a, he's a believer in that, and most of his wit and all of his witnesses almost have right. passed uh, many else as well. So he is and but however, the problem with this witness was that uh, later, as we looked into his background, he had several contacts with these professional debunker groups mm -hmm. who have plagued uh, Travis Walton and his witnesses for so many years. Uh, so because of that, this particular witness was never accepted by Travis and and won't be rightfully so uh, because those contacts uh, are very make it very make overall his persona very suspect as far as um as far as Travis goes. So yeah, so for that reason this witness has never been accepted by Travis. Uh but like I said, but his what he did see was very uh, really captured my imagination. That's why I decided to portray that uh, on my book. And the other thing about that is that Travis and and we were talking about authenticity and what real evidence is. Well, to me real evidence is what Travis and his witnesses have been maintaining the exact same truth for 40 years now. It's been 40 years without deviation, without backstep whatsoever. And people don't know, but it's against incredible pressure, right. incredible challenges, incredible, sometimes uh, not, not the most honest kind of attacks against them. And that's been going. And yet, if you go look at an interview that uh, Travis has given within about the truth of what happened to him during that time when he disappeared for five days and was taken somewhere by alien visitors uh, where he woke up and was and was there for five days, uh, he is perfectly you can hear it in his voice you can see it in his testimony you can see it in his demeanor he is absolutely completely truthful in everything that he says and that's real that's real evidence in the book talk to me about uh, you know we've talked about some of the more famous cases what was one of the more chilling stories that you included in this book that people might not be familiar with Oh, okay. Here's one for you. It's the story of Martha X. Martha X was part of an, what we call an outreacher group. There are groups that are, they're sort of like meditation groups. They usually have a guru that leads them. Uh, well, we call it a guru, but you know, it's uh, like a, a team leader. And he, she was a part of this group that uh, regularly does outreach to alien visitors. And this is, you know, something volunteer. Not, whatever happens is not going to be an abduction because they have consented to this. They want to make the contacts. And for the most part, these are extremely positive experiences. And I believe that they, these groups also do like, they do like a white light protection kind of thing where they, you know, they, they use various blessings and so forth to make sure that they are protected against negativity and so forth. It's, it's a whole process. But anyway, Martha X was a member of a group like that. And she was one day she was, and usually these contacts are minimal in nature. They're just, voice sort of voice contacts and and speaking with alien visitors uh sometimes they can go as far as observations where there is the appearance uh, an appearance of alien visitors or the ufos appear to them as a signal as signals and so forth well on one particular night martha x uh, received started receiving voice contact uh from what she took to be alien visitors after an outreach session 
and she was directed to go to her room that night to remove all to remove all human materials from her from her person like uh like perfume uh, nail polish uh clothing she had to lay upon her bed uh flat and she had to and she was told to wait for contact and instead of contact she was dematerialized from and she did everything she was told she was looking forward to this experience very much and she was dematerialized instead from her bedroom to somewhere else she said it felt like she was on a table of metal but it was metal that was alive and yielding and seemed to sort of light up wherever her body was in contact with it so it was sort of metalish but yet it was soft and she was in a room she couldn't move she couldn't see anything and there appeared to be hands working on her and doing taking samples from her of all kinds and at some point she says the experience became very invasive that's how she put it extremely invasive and at some point uh it became invasive in a very intimate way uh she was then sprayed with a sort of greenish sort of mist that made her more receptive to the probing that she received and she said it did work at some point at some point she felt like she was wanting to get out of the situation she was not happy with the uh, methods that they were extracting samples from her and she said it became a, a she said it became a very non-voluntary situation at one point she was told to stay calm she was told to to relax and at that point she said she was barely able to see but she did see figures that were that appeared to be grays grays around her both short, the smaller ones and taller ones as well but she said overall they were just giving her the message telepathically to stay calm to relax and that uh but then she heard she heard something from one of them and again this wasn't through her ears this was in her mind she heard something from one of them one of the tall grays that said something along the lines that this one should survive so then she became really alarmed and she started trying to struggle trying to tell them she wanted not to be there anymore and she was very upset she tried to get out but the situation kept going and they removed all the samples from her that they wanted they did all the all the very very invasive probing that they needed to do and she was very traumatized by the situation but she was eventually returned she was returned and she tried to talk to the group and tell them what happened to her uh and she was told that if her experience turned negative it's because she allowed fear to dictate her emotions in other words any negativity was her own fault she was told <laughs> yeah yeah hey listen things went horribly bad here because you got afraid if you just let us do what we want to and probe yes. you, it would have been fine yes. Boy, that's uh, typical abuser behavior right there isn't it I thought I thought so. Yeah. You know, and so she basically, you know, after that she left the group. She was very disappointed with the guru of the group and she never had experiences with them again. However, she was then after that she was given an experience. She had an experience of um she believed she was abducted again after that and she was implanted with uh devices and she says these are devices that still plague her today uh interestingly she's a professional artist and her and again people are going to resonate with this cuz i've seen it happen so many times she's an artist whose art went up went through the roof in skill and ability after her experience and now she's a very successful professional artist who creates paintings and all kinds of works of art that are very very successful and i have a and when you ask her about removing her implants uh she gets very fuzzy <laughs> on on that she doesn't she she says she wants them removed but she gets very fuzzy on why she hasn't had them removed but when i see her art i mean 
it becomes kind of clear why. Because she probably feels like her creativity and her abilities have increased many fold. And a lot of abductees, I believe, experience the same thing. They, um, so they feel kind of, they feel sort of chosen. Uh, and they feel very special and they feel like they've been given special abilities also. And so they're kind of tortured by these implants, but, but she was told by alien visitors that the implants are not from them, that the implants are from government agents who abducted her and are trying to keep track of her to try to keep her from them. So she has this whole narrative going on that everything, anything bad that happened to her is from the government and everything positive is from the alien visitors. So, you know, it's all a lot of psychiatric material there to be looked at as well. Terrifying. Do you believe, John, that you've been visited? Have you been abducted or manipulated in any way by these alien visitors? Not abducted or manipulated, but yes, I have uh, my own experiences of alien visitors, and they happened uh, during my childhood. I was about, and I can tell you the first one was an observation experience, which uh, people who are visited a lot of, many, many times, they have an observation experience first. And I contend that these UFOs collect information and bring it back to the alien visitors who then decide, okay, it's time for a personal visit. Uh, and what I was nine years old and I was in New York City uh, with my parents. Uh, we were at a big, big rented dance hall, a uh, couple of, couple of hundred, few hundred people in there having a party late at night. It was like a reception for a wedding, something along those lines. And there were a lot of little kids there. And for some reason, little kids decided that we would all get together. And again, I was nine years old, get together and run outside when the adults weren't looking, run out into the night, run wild on our own, even though it was, a, it was almost one in the morning. And it was probably the latest all of us had ever stayed up. But we ran out and started playing tag. And we ran far away from the building the, where the party was going on. And it was late. It was late at night, one in the morning. And the streets were deserted. Uh, there was nothing out there. But we were in the middle of the city. And... and I was I was looking up at two of the tallest buildings I'd ever seen, and it was a starry, very starry night. But uh, the game that we were playing got kind of heated, and one of the other kids uh, hit me in the stomach. So I went down on the sidewalk. One of the kids said, oh, he's really hurt. So they did what kids do. They all ran away, ran back to the building where we had come from. And they were gone. And I was laying there on my back. I was looking up at the sky. I was looking up between two of the tallest buildings I'd ever seen. And I saw that there was an area where there were no stars. They were blotted out. And I was trying to look closer at why that was happening. I looked closer up between the two buildings, well, high above the two buildings. And I got up on my feet. I kept looking. And there was a black ink cloud. That's what like a kind of squid would give off when you try to grab them with your hand. And this black inky cloud was just hanging there up above the tall buildings and out from the bottom of this black ink cloud came what you would call a flying saucer what anybody would call a flying saucer and it had the light spinning in the bottom and it came down and it was coming down towards me and there were two teenage girls on my right on my left side and they were standing there and they were they were just yelling and screaming saying the world's coming to an end you better run home little boy and then they were gone and i looked up and i felt like a spotlight hit me from this vehicle that was coming towards me and at that moment it was like we both changed our minds i took a back step and the vehicle changed direction and started going back up and that was it. it started going back up into the cloud and it was like a cartoon character jumps in the hole pulls the hole in after it uh this thing went up into the cloud and then the cloud disappeared it was gone that was it and then i ran back to the hall where my parents were i ran back there i told them what happened to me. They weren't that happy to hear about it in public. And they told me, don't tell us at home later. And, uh, that was, that was it. That was my first observation experience. And then shortly after that, I had an experience at the, uh, at the apartment where I lived. And if we have time in this cut, I can, I can tell you about that as well. Yeah, well, go ahead. We'll hear this story. We're going to have to wrap up after that, but we're definitely going to have to get you back in here uh, sometime soon to continue <laughs> because this went way too fast for us today. 
Okay. Um, okay. So then, if I can tell the rest of the story, I was Please. in my I was in my home. I was in the uh, apartment, and I was nine years old. So I was playing that game where you try to stay up as late as you can. Right. And uh, I was watching the, this. I was watching this old fashioned clock, and I had a little bedroom that was for some reason was kitty corner was right in the kitty corner to my parents' bedroom. So if I opened the door, I could see my parents' bedroom in there, and it and I left the door open uh, at that time and my parents were dead asleep and I was uh, I was trying to stay awake and suddenly a cold vapor goes through the room and I go stiff stiff as a board and then uh, there's hands at my feet and my head and I feel them lifting me up I lift up like a, like a balloon half heal, half filled with helium I mean I just float wherever they lift me and I stay there it's like just like a plank filled with helium just just move where they could move me anywhere in the air that they wanted and wow. I would just stay there and they start lifting me up and I was so stiff I couldn't see who or what was lifting me I mean I could feel them there but I couldn't see them and apparently they were able to it was like they could walk on the air because they were walking on the air, lifting me up towards the ceiling. And I could feel that happening. And apparently they were passing through the ceiling themselves and were trying to put me through the ceiling as well. But my forehead just wouldn't go through. That was the first part that was supposed to go through. And it kept, they bumped it and it wouldn't go through. And they seemed kind of confused by this. They lowered me halfway down again and then they started examining the spot where I wouldn't go through the ceiling, like like the worst engineers of all time. And they just kept on looking at it and examining it. Then they tried again. And it was just bump, bump, bump. And it wouldn't go through. And they were very confused by this. And as they bumping my head, I was able to move my neck a little more and more each time until finally I decided I had to look down because just in case, and so I don't know why this thought right. occurred to me, but a thought occurred to me, maybe I was dead. And so I tried to, the first thing I tried to see was my bed to see if there was a body, my body was in it. And I looked down and no, it was nothing there except the, the sheet, the blanket. And so I was like, I was relieved. At least I was alive. And again, they, went back to bumping my head, trying the same action over and over again. That didn't work, the definition of insanity, I guess. But they kept on trying to do the same thing that didn't work over and over again. And the more they bumped my head, I was able, to, again, to move more and more. And I looked over at my parents. I could see them. The door was open. I could see them laying in bed, and they were being there were hands over them, like holding them in a stasis field. It seemed like, and I could see my dad was in a pool of sweat, and he was trying. It was like he was trying to wake up, but he couldn't. And my parents were there, and they were still asleep. And I saw the hands, and I saw. I looked, and I could see the creatures that were standing over there. It was just small grays the large head those black sort of wraparound eyes and one of them looked directly at me from the high vantage point where i was and i looked down and for just a second we locked eyes i saw them and i heard the only words i ever heard from them uh the one that was looking at me all i heard and not in my ears but in my head i heard he's awake and in that moment everything fell out i just i dropped like a stone onto my bed and they disappeared they were gone and everything was gone i could feel that there was nothing in the apartment at that moment it was it was uh normal temperature again did you have these memories all throughout your life or or were they did they resurface as you got older uh i had the memory since it happened since wow. the time that it happened but i never had any sort of re, re visitation or reobservation since that period and in the cases I've looked at since then uh, what I've seen over and over again is that these alien visitors seem to find out right away if somebody is their flavor or not okay <laughs> And some people say it has to do with blood type. Some people say it has to do with DNA structure. I don't know, but but I never got another visitation, observation, nothing after that. And yeah, that was a very long time ago. And I I see people who get those visits at about the same age that I did, about nine, ten years old, and then they keep getting visits throughout their life. You know, why do you uh, think they stopped with you? Did they have a, an inkling of what you would become? 
and I, that might pose an issue for them in the future? I don't know. I, I don't know why, the, but I just think I was not their flavor for whatever reason, whether that has to do with blood type or DNA structure or whatever it was. Uh, I just think that, and what's funny is uh, what I've seen since then is that not only when someone is their flavor, because that's the way I like to say it, they not only do they visit that person repeatedly throughout their adult lives, but they'll go to the next generation of kids also and, and start having experiences with them as well. And it can be multi-generational. So it's amazing how they find out right away whether they want that person or not. And they really stick to that decision, whatever it tends to be, apparently, since uh, I see how how abruptly mine right. stopped. Well, John, how you're our up. flavor for sure. We we love having you on here, and I'd love to have you visit with us again here in the next month or so if we can get you back and, and explore more of these stories and concepts. Uh, would you do that and, and come back to us? Absolutely, Dave. That would be fantastic. This our has been pleasure. a pleasure. A great pleasure for me. So, uh, the book, again, The Extra Dimensionals, True Tales and Concepts of Alien Visitors. We'll put up a link to John's website so you can find him and all of his books. We'll also put up a link to that FBI website that he mentioned earlier, vault.fbi.gov. That's vault.fbi.gov, and you can look up the subjects, Unexplained Phenomena, to find some of the cases and stories that we spoke about here tonight on the show. Well, that's it for this evening. Remember, I'll be back tomorrow with Coast to Coast am sitting in for george nori we're going to take a scientific look at uh, supernatural investigating and our guest has a very important uh, message we shared this a few weeks ago from a ted talk but um, one uh, aspect of paranormal investigating that has been grossly overlooked and uh, may save your life so make sure you tune in for that tomorrow coast to coast am dot com forward slash stations to find stations and times in your city state and area to listen to the show tonight jimmy church has earth changes and ancient mysteries on coast to coast am with master builder and architectural designer geological explorer and renegade scholar randall carlson who has over four decades of research and exploration into the interface between ancient mysteries and modern science so joining jimmy church tonight they'll discuss his research into earth changes and catastrophic events as well as ancient mythology astronomy paleontology symbolism sacred geometry and architecture followed by two hours of open lines in the latter half of the the show. I'll be there tomorrow night and Tim and I will be back with you next Monday when we open it up to Parashare Supernatural News. That's the best of Paranormal Talk Radio. Remember to check us out five days a week, Monday through Friday. You can listen to us here on Podcast One or on iTunes. Subscribe so you never miss a minute of the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. Special thanks to our guests this week and also a very special uh, thanks to our advertisers and sponsors we have uh, that are part of our world and part of our show on amazon.com true car thank you for being here and believing in us be safe be kind love one another and we'll be back with you next week here on beyond the darkness the white house says it's a go democratic response on health care i'm jackie quinn with an ap update 